Hi folks. As we discussed in class, I want to take a few more minutes and talk a little more specifically about the Internet of Things, and I call it through the looking glass. Uh, important, you can't craft strategies these days of fully understanding the implications of this phenomena that this growing, that stealth mode, even though it's been around for a decade or two, it's stealth, it's coming over you, it's going to overlap you, it's going to make you who you are, and you need to craft your strategies having full understanding of what's emerging through the fog that you can use in your business. Uh, it's almost negligent not to understand that and running large corporations today. So let's look at that for a few moments if we can. The first thing we need to think about is strategic leadership. That's the ability to effectively and to critically think about what's going on around us, looking at the ecosystem and understanding that. Uh, we need to understand specifically the, the new emerging issues that are taking place that are opportunities to be exploited or, or, or going to present damage to our organization that needs to be mitigated. So we need to look at that. Um, in today's chat, I've divided it up into uh, four sections very briefly, and I can't do it in great depth, but the book that comes out in the, in the, in the spring will have this in far more depth. This is just a draft copy of that to help us out in our class today. But first, we'll talk about what is the Internet of Things, and we'll give you some specific examples, because every industry will be impacted, and I'm going to touch on a number of industries to say, here's some of the things that are coming through the fog that you need to deal with and start thinking about. But every industry has these, and as we get through this thing today, I'm going to ask you to reflect if you think about your industry and your business and what's coming through you need to deal with. Next, a wonderful book by uh, Jeremy Rifkin um, talks about the uh, new zero marginal cost economy, society, and the impact that's going to have on us, the idea of the collaborative commons of new mental models that are going to be required. We need to look at those things together uh, as they're going to simply drive new emerging business models. The old ones just will not work. The ones that were developed to meet the industrial age challenges are quickly dying. We need to have new business models, and we're looking at those. Um, and to do that, in this, the third part of our presentation, we'll talk in terms of the, the need for you to be futurist, to sit on the stump with the door closed for a few minutes and reflectively think out in front as to what are the so what's, that merger of the front page and the, the business section together that we do in our, in our class weekly. Um, what emerges out of that? What can you use in there and uh, to your benefit, to your advantage? We need to look at those things. And then finally, what are going to be the impact of this new marginal economy on, uh, on the normal pest factors of the economy and societal and, and, uh, and political? Uh, what's going to happen to Canada? Let's have a look at those things too today. So for part one then, what is the Internet of Things? Well, it's, it's nothing more than this interconnectedness, if you will, of, of everything, of, of humans, of animals, of objects, all with some sort of unique sort of code uh, chip of some description with them, identifiers, that will seamlessly transfer information back and forth, and we can communicate in some cases over this global internet network that's being developed. In fact, some refer to it, and I will later on this later on this session talk the green internet network when we refer to the energy that is now possible uh, to, to be harnessed and used through this system. Um, in fact, it occurred to me that while the popular phrase is "Internet of Things," um, I think before this session is out today, this video is out you may come to the conclusion that it's not just the Internet of Things, but rather it's the Internet of Everything, because it, it's going to touch the whole situation. Yes, so I say everything. That certainly there's 50 to 100 trillion objects. Uh, they're going to be able to follow uh, the movement, uh, and a lot you won't know about, um, and also communicate those movements back and forth over this Internet. Um, you're going to be surrounded by 1,000 to 5,000 trackable objects, um, from your car to your phone to your computer to your refrigerator, etc., will all be tracking and feeding data into this large database that's being built up on you. Um, and we'll talk about some of that. And it's all in large part being done without your knowledge. Uh, you just do it daily without thinking about it, but uh, the collection takes place day in and day out while you're sleeping and it's still happening. In fact, they say by 2020, we'll have over 30 billion devices will be connected to the Internet of Everything. Uh, they suggest the Gartner Group uh, looked at this and said it's going to increase our GMP uh, globally by one point trillion dollars. Uh, recall that Canada's GMP is not much more than that as we sit today. That's the total sum of every uh, dollar made by every man, woman, and child in the, in the, in the company in, in, the, in Canada comes to just about that number. And that's the value added this Internet of Things is going to bring to us all in the next three or four years. Um, but I don't think the Gardner Group went far enough. It hasn't said what the cost would be 
in sense of labor and those who lose their jobs as a result of it. Certainly, the Internet of Things will, will add to the economy, but it does so at a cost on the other side of the ledger that I think we'll see as we get into this today. This, this looking glass we talk about is well underway. Uh, it's already started. We talk about cloud computing. We talk about wearable technology. Um, nations are already moving quickly to the fore to, to harness, to get involved, to be the first out of the box. Uh, Britain's got $40 million being set aside this year specifically for uh, research and development to drive this Internet of Everything for Britain so it can help take its place in this. And it begs the question, what's Canada doing? Have you heard anything about it, doing anything at all in the Internet of Things? I certainly haven't seen any focused uh, uh, research taking place in that area that we can uh, be proud of. Um, the top companies that are doing the current work, uh, these are the leaders uh, that are involved in Internet of Things right now, mostly American, as we look at it, mostly Asian. Um, not much there from Canada, you'll note. But as we look at that, with Moore's Law, which is based on silicon, um, it's coming to the end of its term. And so we see this, this possible migration out of silicon and Moore's Law having its day and moving now to, the, to uh, gallium gas and things of that nature, which will be many times faster. But with that will come new, new companies that aren't on the screen yet today. And so you want to watch for those opportunities and see. You don't want to be buying the old buggy whip, uh, dragged by a horse uh, wagon, if, if there's going to be some sort of new jet car. Uh, coming out the stream. So watch for that. It may have impact on your business. Uh, with respect to the uh, technology roadmap that's being set out, we're already well way along that. If you look under year 2020 and go uh, straight up on that, you see uh, teleportation, uh, telespace, uh, able to monitor and control distant objects. We're doing a lot of that now. Um, I'll talk in here about cars being actually remotely controlled, airplanes being remotely controlled by uh, by the Internet of Everything. And so uh, we're well on track and uh, achieving the goals that people think that we would have set out. This is going to take a giant leap forward, artificial intelligence and uh, all the Internet of Things, the minute quantum computers come on stream. Patents are being taken out, uh, California universities are, are driving this, UBC has had some interesting breakthroughs last year, and so it's not a far reach to say the new quantum computers will soon be upon us. I'm not talking 10 years, but soon be upon us. With that advent, this thing is going to drive into overdrive. Things you need to know about the Internet of Things just at a very high level. One is that it's, it's digitalization, and that's disruptive. We'll talk about the digitalization of money, etc. as we go through it. The end of Moore's Law is going to be disruptive. The, the idea that the smarter smart meters and that, etc. are on the face cheaper. Uh, the power to run this remains the number one issue, and that's being resolved through uh, um, alternative energy situations. Uh, security of the ecosystem is is horrendous. It's a growing thing that, again, we're not aware of. But before this session's out today, I hope you'll have a greater awareness and appreciation of the security and hacking and things that are available in your life and going on as we speak today. And, uh, and sixth and finally, low uh, asset utilization takes place. Uh, so let's look briefly at some selected industries and just some things that are taking place there that may cause you for a few minutes to think, What's happening in your industry that we need to be aware of? Here's a number. In the agricultural industry, for example, uh, we have a situation that we have these uh, drone-run machines that, uh, with applications, can test the air and the water quality. Uh, they can check the pH reading in the soil to make sure it's not too acid, not too much acid or, or too uh, much of a base in it. Uh, it can check the atmospheric conditions, rain, snow, uh, what's going on. It can monitor the wildlife uh, predators and coming in and out. It can uh, track with a biochip the life of your animals, your cattle, your sheep, etc. Not just during the lifetime, but afterwards in the packing stage and as they move to the, uh, to the meat markets for sale. All that is happening in the agricultural industry, which is going to change the face of that. Can you imagine, for example, that machine being operated seven days a week um, in the black? You can go at night. We don't have a person on the back of it. It just runs uh, on some sort of a track device or sometimes with a... Uh, control switch, a monitor device of a joystick of some description, but it just runs. It's out there in the element going seven days, about four hours for upstream maintenance, doing its work, which speeds up the process. Farmers lose on hay when it starts to rain. Uh, it gets damp again. It's a problem. Here, because they can get the extra hours in, uh, almost three times with uh, efficiency, um, makes a big difference in agriculture, as it does reduce the cost of food. If you don't have an operator, a driver, or a farmer running that machine, the costs come down. 
um, the idea of the automobile industry. I call it the snitchmobiles because they're now tracking everything you do. We all know the story that if the car breaks down, you can contact somebody and just say, my car is broken down, and all of a sudden they can operate it from a distance. Your computer, if your computer breaks down, somebody in your help desk IT can operate it and clean it all up for you. But of course, it's not a leap to say they don't need your invitation to do that. And so these mobile offices, I'm going to call them, the idea you get in, it doesn't have a, frack or a front or a back. Apple's talking about one coming out in 2019. Uh, Google's not far behind. There's a whole cluster of folks that are producing these, these mobile offices. And if, if that's the case, we only use the car about 4% of the time. I mean, it just sits out in front until you're ready to use it. Uh, if I could just have one of these little pods arrive on demand and take me where I want to go and I could hop out, wouldn't be looking for parking spaces, etc. cetera. Um, far more efficient way to do it, getting better utilization out of the asset we just talked about, as opposed to having it sit outside and rusting until I'm ready to use it the, for the next 4% of the time. And so that's important. But it's not just cars, it's, it's everything we're going to talk about here today. It, it's, it's the trucks, it's intermodal transportation, it's boats, heavy equipment, trains, planes. And of interesting, in my last book, I, I, I put this in, the idea of this uh, hybrid air vehicles, the idea they can lift more than uh, C-130s uh, that carry stuff for the military. This thing can take many, many container loads. Can you imagine that up in Canada's north where the permafrost is, is melting at the present time? And we're talking about trying to put roads across this undulating soft mush to feed our Canada's north. Well, these things can do it for us. They can land anywhere. They go at 180 miles an hour. Um, they can have solar skins that uh, operate. They don't have people in it. They're run by a drone system again, That uh, just like the American military drones. This is a drone operation takes you up there and sets down anywhere. It can set on the snow anywhere it wants. It can do surveillance of Canada's north on ships through the passages. We just have to think out here for a few minutes of, of all the marvelous things that are happening in the automobile industry that uh, may impact your businesses. Here are some companies that now have permits actually to be testing these driverless cars on the highways and on the roads and in the test shops. And it's taking place already. Trucks are now working on the highways. Um, drone trucks are now operating outside the lab's environment on the highways uh, as we speak. Here's a video on uh, Wired Magazine, one of the incredible uh, um, if you're into computers and technology, a wired magazine, good one to look at. But they produced a little video of uh, that. There's a link there for you. That a car was driving at 70 miles an hour, 10 miles away, and these hackers were able to take control of the vehicle from the driver and move it left, right, park it, take it right, slow right down, do anything they wanted with it. And so it's not a far reach when you think of this potential of these connected cars to the internet, and they're all going to be connected as as they un unfold. Um, What's that mean to the CIA, it means to the military, it means to police? I mean, does it have aircraft application? We've heard the stories of actually uh, with your iPad, uh, some people have actually been able to interfere with the, uh, the uh, netting, the internet, communicate with the planes as they're in the air. Um, big concerns here, things we should be looking at. Again, the security that, that impacts on our business. Um, this hijacking, look at that again, the idea that controls everything from brakes to sounds to horns to heat, they put the fan on, as I remember in that video, it was uh, just interesting to uh, see the control they had over your, your machine, and it tracks everything in your life. You have an accident from now on, you won't be able to say that you weren't drunk driving, or you won't be able to say you didn't go through the stop sign, etc., etc. They'll have little black boxes in them. They'll be all in great detail of what you did. It's going to reduce insurance rates. It's going to put the blame where the blame belongs. It's all going to be tracked how many hours you do driving. You say you don't use your car for business, they'll know. Suncor. A uh, large Canadian, very large Canadian firm in, in Canada uh, doing work, just ordered 170 of these driverless trucks of this magnitude, this size. They go seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day, I think four hours down for, for maintenance, hauling. They're going to not hire the drivers that currently make in excess of $100,000 a year to move these things uh, for their eight-hour labor. Gone. Those jobs are disappearing. And these people are going to be hauling using these things. This, as you see here, it's going to... Uh, uh, save money on fuels, maintenance costs are going to drop, the wear and tear on tires because these things are better um, at taking care of the equipment than the individual. All those savings are coming in, and that's just the first tranche, 175. They're going up to 600. And uh, it won't be long for other oil, oil companies uh, are doing the same sort of thing because in this as in all things, this stealth mode is coming at you so quickly. If you don't adopt quickly to these things and you say, I'll wait, it'll be too late. 
because the Suncors will already be employing, achieving better bottom lines, and with better bottom lines, they can bring their costs down and can compete with you, and once again, squeeze you out of the market on everything. This is just one example. So it's interesting to look at this. Intermodal transportations, uh, electronic tolls, things of that nature, um, fleet management, vehicle control, etc. waterways are all connected. Imagine for a moment with this intermodal transportation and these drone trucks and things, um, black warehouses I want to talk about in a minute as we get to it. The insurance industry is under attack. Uh, Google has shown the number of accidents with these drones driving is so much safer than individuals driving cars that the insurance rates are anticipated to drop by 60%. Your car insurance, my car insurance, will drop by that percentage point. If indeed we have car insurance, if we use the pods, we don't need car insurance. It will be included in the rental fee for have a plastic little pod that drives up in front of us, probably made with 3D printers. Um, education industry, massive online education, they're called MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S, MOOCs. We had a, a, a symposium here about two years ago at Royal Roads looking at the possibility. But uh, one of the institutions, Wharton, I'm affiliated with in, in, the, in the States, has been doing this quite successfully now about three or four years. They put almost 10 million people through this, uh, through this system on MOOCs. And as you can see here, if you want a Wharton MBA that normally costs 200,000 U.S. dollars, um, all in to include your accommodation and other, uh, other fees, um, you can have the first year free. You can go online and take a strategy course, just like this strategy course, free, no charge. Get your certificate at the end of it. Uh, this is what you give up, a uh, colleague, Huss, Hussman down there, a uh, nice fellow, in fact, he was involved with our symposium, the director of the program. Um, uh, Don uh, suggested these are things you don't get with it, but it's already there. It, it's free to take this first-level course this way, uh, first year's courses in your MBA program, do them online. And that leads me to uh, the way of the future. We don't need bricks and mortars and schools of, of Royal Roads and UVic and things of that nature to the extent we have with 30 or 35 people in a classroom. Uh, is far more efficient. This, this, As you go through this course, ask yourself, could I deliver this course to 10,000 people today? I suspect I could. 10,000 people could watch this video today. Um, do some self-testing. I have to change the exams modules around a little bit. Give a certificate when you complete it all, and it's free. And we'll talk about the business model, how we make money and all that. Uh, uh, we can make more money on, on doing MOOCs in the sense of... Uh, charging for the course pack, say $100 for a course pack, instead of what you paid for your textbook. And I want to mention that, uh, I think I made a misstatement earlier about the 19th, it's the 18th edition, the 19th is out, but I stayed with the 18th to finish up this year uh, with it, the 18th edition. But what you paid was atrocious for that textbook. It's a great textbook, it's a keeper, but the price of, of books are going up so high, if you simply got a course pack of my materials in this thing, paid 100 bucks for it, times 10,000 people, that's more money the university makes from all of the MBA courses and other courses uh, just by running free MOOCs to folks. In fact, it leads me to what I think universities are going to become. Will the Internet of Everything mean that we become browsers? That you come to me or some people like me and sit down and say, Terry, I want to get an uh, executive MBA program. I'll be able to take from around the world the best courses. I can say, well, go to Wharton, take the strategy course, go get uh, um, Michael Porter's course uh, in, in, in Harvard, and all these things are available. MIT's got its courses up online. Uh, for you, I want you to take this course, this course, this course, get the certificate as having completed, bring them back to me, take a few courses here at Royal Roads, and we'll put a stamp on you certifying you're now an executive MBA. But the beauty is you can do that course in your own time, anywhere in the world, and in the module, the links that you want to do, and you have the benefit of whatever skill sets I bring to the table to say, of all the courses in the world, do you want to take the strategy course from... Uh, UVic or Thompson Rivers or Royal Roads, or do you want to take it from Wharton? I can make that decision and put you in that, that, that sort of track line. And it brings the cost of education down because we all know education costs are high. We know the idea of the, uh, of the student loans are, are not so much at this institution, but other institutions are, are completely out of hand. But this brings the cost of education down, both in the cost of books and the cost that we, we need to charge to uh, cover the overhead bricks and mortars and sports stadiums and things of this nature. Um, so uh, education industry, my point is, is that it too was under attack and it was going to have to change to get in step with the, the new realities that are heading our way. The taxi industry, we're all in awe of Uber and what it's doing globally on its, on its things, but even then it's going to change the model of those people who put their cars into the Uber situation. The minute the pods come online, Uber will probably buy those pods and those taxi drivers will be unemployed, just like the, the transportation truckers and folks we talked about with Suncor are unemployed. 
and that's part of the story we're going to talk about as we go through this today. Um, the, the idea that Japan, China, and Europe, and this one happens to be from the Google people that are putting it out, but the implications for the workers and uh, they're being misplaced, we need to talk about and think about. The idea of insurance, of auto, sa auto sales, I mean, the number of auto sales are going to collapse uh, Jimmy Patterson's empire, et cetera, et cetera. Why are we buying cars when we're going to get these, these little pods? In fact, this open source 3D printing, they're now printing plastic little cars that get superimposed like a golf cart on, on an aluminum platform, which is electrical, budget price, and we can almost produce one anywhere in the world. We don't need to be near the factory in Detroit to do it. We can produce them here in Victoria and put them on little aluminum bodies with a 3D printer at a budget price and recycle a lot of materials. So it, it's shifting. Um, the media, um, we talked in terms, it was said that if you want to communicate with a common man, it was Wordsworth, I think, at the time, the, the all prose was being done in a very high society sort of language and lexicon that only the, the upper crust could understand. And it was Wordsworth came out and said, I think it was him, said to the fact that if you want to communicate with a common man, use the common man's language. And so he brought the level of conversation, the the, 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 the wordsmithing down to a level that the common man could understand. And I think the same thing has to happen here uh, with with Didia. We have, we have to get in step with what the common man wants. And so we talked in terms of, of newspapers. Um, the idea today, I uh, talked in terms of what's in the news. We looked at the newspaper and what's in the business section, what's in the front page, and what we can draw from it, and what's going to impact our, our world. And uh, that's interesting, but that newspaper, under the old model of the Internet, of, of the... Uh, of the old capitalist business model, you had that curve that went down, and you had the learning curve and all those things we talked about, learning curve and experience curve and uh, economies of scale curve to a point to get the marginal cost, and at that point, it's a break even. And then if you push it past that, the curve actually tends to go, to go up a little bit. But with the Internet of Things, uh, that's not true. That newspaper I read today, if it's online, bypasses that curve, and 7.2, 7.3 billion people in the world, if they had the Internet, could read it. Close to zero costs. Pretty interesting. It's completely disruptive. The idea of the old cable television of Shaw's and uh, Bell and those folks hooked up, they realize it's coming and they're moving fast. Um, Apple TV, the idea of going on to a, some sort of a fresh little box, uh, Netflix, etc., are all new business models coming in to challenge the old models. And so the way media communicates and cuts out the advertising Common man doesn't want to sit and watch the advertising, so these boxes collapse the advertising portion of it, which makes it more attractive, but puts the challenge out, how do the advertisers um, get their message out? But it brings the cost down. And so you folks need to look at those, uh, those existing models, business models you have in your businesses, and figure, how is this going to impact? How can you bring it down? Let me talk a little bit about the business models that you have in your organizations. Um, in a few moments, I'll get into that. The, the idea of the building and housing industry, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but the idea of, again, these, these monetization, that, that not monet, the, these monitors that they put in the, for, the, for, for controlling your heat from the door to the digital electrical uh, um, meters that are on the front of your house, etc., are all communicating and talking to each other, and you can control your home from, from your cell phone anywhere in the world at this point. And that comes with certain synergies, certain energies, things that are saved, but the other side of that, it also comes with some disclosure of some of what you're doing with your life and what you're expending it on and how often you open the fridge door, how often you do your washing, uh, what sort of beer you drink, etc. So it's, it's data information flow in and out, but we want to look at that. Um, consumers are going to be impacted by intelligent shopping systems. Not uh, reach, it's being happening today. You can take your little, uh, your little uh, handheld cell phone sort of thing and before you get to the restaurant you can uh, have a picture of where you are, a picture of the restaurant, send it to your friend, I'll meet you at the restaurant. On the way to the restaurant, you can pop up the menu, you can order on the menu, say I'll be there in 10 minutes, have it ready. You can walk in, have your dinner, have a conversation, take other pictures, uh, record uh, the, the lunchtime meeting if you like. Um, then you can uh, pay your bill online, click, 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 with a Apple Pay or something of that nature and walk away. It's completely changing how we do business and with that comes less people involved to take your orders and to, et cetera. Imagine the hotel industry. Um, I can pull up in my car now at a couple of hotels that don't have a real front desk any longer. They have it all on this machine here scanning my face and all faces are getting scanned with our highlights that they can recognize facial recognition features. It, it's happening whether you like it or not. We're now being put into a database. And so getting out of the taxi, people can scan, know who it is, 
and uh, the uh, bellhop that comes out to the door with his little thing in his ear has the machine download the information to him. This is Terry Power. Um, he's got three kids, da 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 dump and uh, the uh, bellhop's able to address me. It's good to see you again, uh, Dr. Power, and how are your three kids? Jennifer's one, etc., etc. And uh, can I take your bag? Same room as normal? Yes, it is. And uh, we don't stop at the desk. We go straight up because he's already been booked online as he's talking to me. The booking's taking place electronically, and he walks right up and takes you into your hotel room directly. And the same is shipping out. We don't need the front desk anymore. All this is happening to us as we speak at a cost of labor. Uh, healthy living devices, monitoring from, from our birth to our death. Uh, we're all getting cells and chips and new uh, health monitoring systems. That's going to make it safer for us, be more efficient for us, reduce the involvement with, uh, with our doctors because it'll be done online. Then they can get these little tidbits built up very quickly on who we are and what's going on. Um, the city's adopting apps for parking and uh, uh, navigating as to where the parking spaces are available, um, putting up the agendas, etc., for the city council meetings. This is all changing as we go through it. Banking industry, do you need a bank anymore? Truly, do you need a bank anymore? I'm not sure we do. Um, if you get into this electronic internet of everything banking, um, it seems to me that uh, I've got no affinity to my bank. If I want a mortgage, I can go to a mortgage broker online, say, get me a best mortgage I can, here are my requirements. It's all done online. I don't have a relationship. Do you have a relationship with your bank anymore? I don't think we do. The old days we did. We knew our banker. We knew the bank manager. They had some discretion. They knew you as an individual. But today it's just a box we go to. And I'm not sure we need those big boxes. They're going to collapse down in size. They're very small little boxes of an open kiosk type situation. Again, a lot of computers in there. And so banks, I'm not sure we build up this, this relationship any longer uh, with banks. Um, and we don't have that loyalty to banks. It doesn't really matter to me which bank I use, as long as I can do it online and my investments online, I can transfer my funds electronically, digitally, back and forth from my home and not go out in the rain. That's what I want. Waste removal. Big thing happening in New York as we speak. The old days we had at the department stores, I recall as a young man in the 50s, the, uh, they had these pneumatic tubes. You sent a message, and it went like a vacuum cleaner. It went up to three floors up and a pop. They opened up the message and sent down one pair of running sneakers back down again. Um, nothing more sinister than that. They've got now these big generators driving it. So the idea of having a waste management disposal trucks holding up traffic and coming down your way in, in downtown Vancouver or Victoria, etc., are giving way right now to this idea of uh, of this pneumatic pumping system. New York is now have, has it. And so the garbage just goes down, the sucking sound goes out and goes directly to the uh, to the landfill site, and you never see it. It's just gone. And less traffic, once again, less workers. You don't need the trucks driving on the roads, and uh, you don't need the uh, truck drivers. Interesting, robotics, artificial intelligence, things that are taking place with us. Um, certainly in the manufacturing industry, there are emerging now what we call black manufacturing plants. These are plants that are in total darkness, no heat, but they're run completely by robots, by artificial intelligence. and. Uh, that's kind of interesting because it means there's no people, no high cost. It goes seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. It's producing that sort of stuff we just saw on the plant, producing. Imagine for a moment that robots take that and load it in the back of drone trucks, and the drone truck drives it down to Vancouver's uh, port authority and takes it there, the container there, and a robot takes the container off the back of the drone truck and moves it onto the drone ship, which is controlled by some sort of a little toggle switch in uh, some warm climate environment like a drone and the thing is taken across the Pacific and it gets to Hong Kong and it's offloaded again by drones, by, by, by robots and then taken from there and delivered. No people involved, very efficient. Don't have to worry about the weather, cold, seven days a week, three o'clock in the morning. This thing is still operating. And these machines and these manufacturing plants, it's going to bring the cost down of manufacturing dramatically as this gets involved. But again, at a cost of, where's the labor going as we do it? Um, and you can respond. We all know in operations management the idea of the uh, Walmart stories of the ability to track their inventory in the back of trucks moving towards the location and sensors and statistical evaluation as to what's selling, what isn't selling, and make sure we target our consumers walking through the mall specifically with stuff they're interested in on their little, if we have a sale today on this, and they get a little pop-up on their walkabout machine. Um, all those things are important to us as we go. 3D printing is, is everywhere, but certainly in, in 
Printing Body Parts, Alberta in Calgary. Uh, they're working on this right now in the medical side of the house and doing some marvelous things. But it's happening on the globe. It's not, it's, not, it's not science fiction. It's happening as we speak today, and you only have to look a little bit uh, to have a look at that. And it's open source. Uh, that's the beauty of this uh, zero marginal based economy. Most of this stuff is open source. People share on what you have to do, these, these templates and the, 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 the software needed to run the uh, 3D printing models. Um, military, big changes there in lasers, big changes in uh, Royal Navy taking 3D printers, actually make a drone that flies, they do them on, on, on the site, on the ship, as required, just pump it in. And here's a picture of a camouflage personnel using some equipment. Not too far of a Schwarzenegger film a little while ago, you can hardly see the person in there, but if you look closely, it's there. You can go to the site, there's a number of these camouflage uh, uh, suits that are being worked on. Military robots, are they dangerous? The arms vote ethical. Uh, but these artificial intelligent robots, and that's going to be a challenge for all of us, they'll have the decision, decision, uh, the ability to make decisions that uh, do we really want them to have. They'll have the ability here to actually, if somebody makes a threatening behavior, to kill. Um, they'll decide who they want to kill. And so we wonder, in fact, you know, one may ask, are dragonflies next? Well, I thought you might ask, but yeah, they are. Makes you smile. There's dragonfly drones and small even bee insect, insects that they're now taking for nano surveillance. Um, and DARPA, the American sort of uh, military arm that uh, sponsors these things, these are under construction and in the air as we speak. Um, there's been reports of them going down city streets, and people see these things and uh, um, just hovers there and again scanning, taking pictures, and moving along. It certainly is uh, a brave new world. Nanotechnology industry. Um, here are five things. There's the nanotubes, which is helping us fight cancer and creating artificial muscles. There's the stretchable electronics that uh, has a lot of applications, but certainly is the idea you'd use it in your uh, in your mobile phone space and healthcare sectors. There's bleeding plastic that actually repairs your car, your piece of plastic, and sort of reheals itself. Uh, there's nano nodes uh, where you want to communicate uh, information back and forth over the computers, the outside world. And uh, we talked about the health a little while ago and want to track your, uh, your wristband and send your blood pressure back or your sugar uh, account back if you're a diabetic back to your GP. Uh, all that is now available. And the, finally, the idea of the nano antennas, which is going to help uh, uh, communicate and do the linking back and forth. All these things are, are coming out now and they're but simply the definition of nano is so small you can't even see them. Artificial Intelligence, this is a great book. Uh, Kaku has uh, got about 10 publications out there. Um, enjoy his work. I recommend this as the one that you might want to see if you're inter interested in artificial intelligence. But he's talking things that just blow your mind away. The idea that uh, I'm an old fart, but uh, I still have the dream that before I end the runway, I'll be able to take whatever I've got in my brain and transfer, you can see here, neutron neuron to neuron into a computer. Uh, whatever I've got up here can go into the computer. And with a holograph, my kids, my grandkids, and their grandkids can come and ask me, ask the computer, some questions. And the computer will respond. Isn't that scary? But that's what they're talking about, this idea. And we can send our thoughts in motion by brain net. Actually happening today, they've got this in rats, that they can actually take a rat and uh, they can lead, they can direct, they can instruct the rat to go through the maze and take the turns to the appropriate place. Um, not too far away for us. Um, we can control computers with our minds. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's, I know they recently tried, because he's lost control of everything, of trying to put some sort of a chip in his brain that would go to the glasses that would still enable him somehow to communicate. Wasn't successful, but they tried. They're getting close to that. And so it's pushing the limit of Im immortality. Um, all this 3D printing of organs and one thing or another, um, you may make it. We're close. But this is a wonderful book if you want to dream the dream for a few minutes and see what's out in front of you, both the good and the bad. Canada got a patent the other day for a space elevator that would be able to go uh, um, high up into space at little to no cost and then uh, shuttle from there our stuff up. And one of the things that's important to us is this green internet energy. And they now are developing and have the idea of six football field um, solar power panels the size of six football fields, that will go up there and hover and just find that, that satellite space so they just stay in that zone. But through the internet, using the ability, they will transport that electricity down to Earth free. 
There's little or no cost. Once you get the basic cost of getting the solar power panels up, the sun's energy operating 24 hours a day, free. And so it's going to reduce the cost, isn't it, for all our businesses. And it's going to reduce the, uh, the old capitalist business model that uh, was based on sort of energy. Well, if energy becomes free, it certainly is going to have a great impact in your business and my business if you don't have to pay for it. And we're, I'm going to say to you, by 2050, that's supposed to be the case, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so in part two, we look at Wirfkin's book. Uh, for a few minutes, he talks in terms of the, uh, this uh, zero-based marginal economy. And uh, we have to understand that as we step through this looking glass, it's like Pandora's box, or little brown fuzzy things, furry things they talk about. Once they escape out of the box, we can't get them back in the box. And once we embark on this internet of everything and everything's connected and, and Big Brother's watching and uh, whether you like it or not, everything you do is being communicated, it's done. We can't get it back in the box. Anybody with Facebook, anybody in the last elections, uh, conservatives, I recall, stepping out, went back into Facebook social media, found some, some misstatements or things that were questionable. Um, it's out there. It's in the database. And it caused them to stand down and not become MPs for our country. Um, Interesting times happening. So, uh, <clears throat> what are some of the consequences? <clears throat> first, the uh, the first challenge that we have here is the, the the is the impact of this zero based marginal economy. I touched upon it earlier that just like the newspaper, the cost of almost everything is going to be collapsing downward to almost zero cost, zero marginal cost, because of free energies, because of the uh, internet, the ability to do things, uh, the idea of as we talked about in the uh, agricultural industry, these machines running uh, 24 hours a day are going to be the cost of food down. Um, the, the paper's down, the media is going to be changed. And so we have this, this uh, hybrid economy, if, if you would, it's, it's between capitalism and, uh, and uh, what we call the collective commons. You remember Harding talked about the commons, the idea of putting cattle out in, the, in an open pasture in the middle of the field and as long as they kept the number of cattle to a reasonable level, the commons survived and grass grew and people had the cattle. The problem with the commons is people sort of fired more cattle than the ground could sustain and all of a sudden uh, it wasn't good for anybody. But we have this, we're in that, that, that mode of moving from the, from the capitalism economic system to this, this new collective commons where uh, we collaborate with each other. Uh, we're not trying necessarily to get the, the best bottom line dollar from everybody and we'll talk a bit about that here. I know it's a different concept to think that way, but it's heading our way. Um, certainly, I think it's fair to say that we're coming to extreme productivity. If, if robots can do this stuff 24 hours a day, most of the stuff we want can be produced by, by robots and by technology and artificial intelligence, whether that be military folks in the field, which are robot soldiers, or whether that's planes or hybrid air uh, dirigibles that are moving goods and services, it's drone ships, drone trucks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the uh, the productivity should be well up there. We have extreme productivity at budget prices. Um, the first uh, ten generations talked about the old industrial age models uh, that took us from the uh, from the uh, um, well, I have it up here, I guess, from uh, from the Watt steam engine back in uh, 17, uh, 17, uh, 69. Uh, and then oil comes in around 1820, and we see the, the less reliance on steam and more and more on oil starts from 1820 up to about 1970, at times time of peak oil crashing. And so we've had two industrial revolutions, both driven by energy in large part, and what they're able to bring in railways and things of that nature. And now we're on the third industrial revolution, which is this uh, collaborative commons, the Internet of Things, and again, this, this green energy that's going to take us to the next level of, uh, as a society, as a nation, as a race. Uh, we need to collaborate on this idea of, I can't think of the word collaborativism, I think towards the word, but we use it, collaborativism, the idea of uh, that we're not socialism or capitalism, but we're more we're into this peer-peer sort of networking thing of what crowdsourcing that we're doing. So in part three, um, I've asked you to play the role of a futurist, uh, to look out in front in your business and uh, this session's over, I'd like you to sit and talk to your people you work with and ask what's happening out there in the Internet of everything that is likely to change your business. Are the things you should be moving and learning more about? Um, certainly your business model, whether you like it or not, is going to be disrupted. And I said, if you don't do something about it, then you're going to be uh, um, among the garbage heap. You have no choice. You have to do it or your competitor will. Um, 
some of the problems. First, let's just look at the, the, old, uh, the old management models of that and look at the new mental models that we sh should do that are going to come into play. Uh, certainly, it's all about the power of one today. It's how you motivate that one individual. And we don't have any metrics to measure the work of that one individual any longer. And we talk about that in our course a little bit. Um, but certainly, Wilson comes out, uh, one of the gurus in 1890, and you can see a statement here that um, most workers simply want to figure the best way they can do the least amount of work without working up a sweat. Um, and Taylor also says a little, far, a little farther along, he says, uh, I don't want any initiative from any man. I just want you to do your job like a machine. That was the mental model that we developed. Um, some of the, the, the models that we still use today on is, is how to get the machinery efficient for producing uh, widgets and things of that nature. How do we speed up the process? How do we cut, find those efficiencies in the process? Uh, Sloan, who comes along, also an engineer, and in fact, there's the Sloan School of Management uh, named after him, uh, well-known in the 20s and straight up to the 1990s. Uh, General Motors was driven by his thoughts on what he, he did. Uh, once again, he makes the comment that employees are simply a cog in the manufacturing process, and that was the thinking up to about 1970, just a clog. Um, time and motion studies, things like that were done. And so we spent a lot of time in, in crafting our strategies on trying to get that repetition, try to get that uh, uh, efficiencies out of the clogs within the organization. Um, and we talk about it here for a few seconds, but we now have to challenge that. We have to find these new mental models that are, that are leading our, our way. And uh, so we have to find these new mental models. Um, let me just suggest to you, if I can, I'm not saying these old models of industrial age models don't work. I'm just saying we have to challenge each one and test them to see if they still have application in the brave new world that we're stepping out in. Some will, some won't. But don't just blindly use all those old models uh, that you were used. Um, let me share a story if I can. Um, being Irish, I guess I can tell the story about Patty. And uh, Patty was coming out of the pub, and he's on his hands and knees in a stark, and uh, he's down this way under the only light standard on his hands and knees. And the constable comes up and says, Patty, my son, what are you doing down there? And he says, Officer, I'm uh, looking for my keys. And... Uh, the constable says, well, Patty, did you lose them there? He says, no, no, officer, I lost them over there. Well, why aren't you looking over there? He says, because it's dark. And that's the problem here is that we're not looking over there in the darkness for the solution. We're still playing underneath the lights for the old models. But out there in the dark, there's little snapshots of lights going on, of things that like we've talked about a bit today, this internet of everything. And we need to start looking at those and designing our strategies and uh, how we deal with people in our organizations to flatten them, the collaborative commons, the collectivist idea. How do we do that? And start thinking about those things in your, your plan. In part four, uh, let's look at the nation's uh, uh, political, economic, societal, some of the changes. Um, certainly some problems with privacy, security, and national security. Certainly in Canada, we're concerned that uh, our data ends up on the American uh, servers south of the border. And with the Patriot Act and other things that are going on down there, uh, many Canadians are concerned about their civil liberties, and rightfully so. Um, but it's a concern for you and your business. How do you secure this information? Uh, has to be done. Yes, certainly privacy and autonomy and control, big issues. Um, but understand governments and business are actively trying to get every tidbit of information about you, as you said, whether you realize it or not, it's taking place. And uh, the problem is this unrelenting attack on our civil liberties. Uh, they're not supposed to be doing this, but they do it uh, through it. And we also give this stuff up willingly to them. We step forward and say, well, if I want to use that software program, that application, I will give you this. And we give up our civil liberties in return for getting this new toy that we want to work with. And we have little input on how this information finally rolls up. We can't challenge it. We can't validate its accuracy. Um, and indeed, when government gets challenged about this under the Freedom of Information Act, they run for cover on what data they control about you, with Revenue Canada and, uh, and uh, CSIS and these sort of people, uh, uh, no-fly lists, those things are, are, are concerns. Um, do you understand that you're being watched? There's no place to hide. In your own homes, your tele new Samsung televisions, Samsung televisions, etc., kitchen appliances, thermostats, um, all this stuff is spying and taking data and information and building up a large dossier on you. Indeed, it's not just businesses, but it's nations and it's you, the individual. Um, cyber attacks are happening as we speak here today. You may not be aware we talk about cyber attacks that have taken place and so what, but I want you to watch this for a second. Just 
how big it is. It's scary. Have a look. The nations are here as who's doing it. And see the frequency. Notice the targets like in Seattle, Microsoft, their, their, their servers, cloud, being attacked. And this can't be stopped. The U.S. National Intelligence Council said it's pretty hard for us to stop this data from being collected. Um, so the challenge to you is how do you mitigate the damage um, and not provide this, this data privacy? Because remember, if you didn't pay for the product, then you are the product. What are some of the national implications? Economic? Well, just some. Grab the banking industry, digital banking, uh, time may be here, certain Europeans are pushing it. These bail-in regimes, you remember in Cyprus, do you remember in Greece, that if you had money in the bank over $100,000, um, the money wasn't yours, it belonged to the state to help their problems. In Canada, we have legislation now. Uh, we looked at legislation now on the books, uh, not here yet, but we certainly, Harper considered it, that your money in your banks didn't belong to you, you get an IOU over a certain level, uh, but they could use that to bail out the country if Canada experienced some difficulties. Uh, Apple Pay and others are challenging the banks, the Internet of Everything is new banking models are coming out that you may not need a bank, but Apple Pay, PayPal, uh, Global Pay, those things are all coming in, into systems. The uh, Europeans are now toying with the idea of a digital currency. We're going to get rid of paper altogether. And the digital currency will mean that the banks can charge you what they call negative interest rates. The privilege of putting your money in the bank digitally, uh, they'll charge you one or two percentage points just for handling your money each month. Scary stuff. And uh, the demise of cash. I mean, I make a point of trying to use as much cash as I can. Because if you lose that, and right now they make you feel like a criminal. If you if you go into the bank and say, I want some cash with some frequency, they wonder what you're using it for. Are you buying drugs? What is it? Instead, it's the lawful tender of Canada. We should be allowed to use it. Try that sometime. Just keep taking some more cash out of the bank and using that for your bills rather than get sucked in with the points to uh, become part of this digital society. Um, important to remember the, the condition of the global currencies and digitalization takes place and uh, the American vehicle currency, but that's not for today. And then finally, the idea that GMPs are going to fall, um, notwithstanding the, the additional GMP that is added by the Internet of Everything, uh, it's my belief, based on the savings on labor and on machinery, on plants and equipment, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, done by robots and drones, etc., um, is going to drive our GMP down. We don't need to buy as many cars. I just want 4% of the time on a pod works well. Stuff we've talked about. So there's going to be tens of millions of workers unemployed. And that leads to a problem, doesn't it? What are we going to do with them? Um, the family unit is under stress. When unemployment takes place, family units break down. Marriages, divorces, foreclosures, those things happen. That $100,000 a year blue-collar worker that drove those big trucks for Suncor, now unemployed, that's a big impact in Alberta. And just have to go to Alberta and see the the destitution that, that's spreading out there as the oil patch industry has closed down. Uh, there's lots of layoffs. I went into a new little kiosk in in, uh, in uh, Red Deer, it was, in Red Deer. Um, and in there, I never saw before, it was just a wall, a kiosk, and on the wall, the little booth out in front, they were selling uh, trailers, skidoos, um, uh, motorcycles, expensive cars, all these bells and whistles that the, the construction worker was able to buy during the good times they're now throwing overboard because they can't. And so they've actually made an industry out of all these bits and pieces you can buy up here for bargain prices on the side. And so uh, it certainly is a, unemployment is going to be a, uh, a big challenge as we adopt this new innovative internet of everything. Um, certainly the Orwellian surveillance on everything you touch, everything you do, um, is going to make us feel safer, warm and fuzzy, terrorism, etc. But it's going to come at a cost of a large boot, as Orwell says, on your face, and you'll never get up. Um, and there'll be new values. Uh, what about your quality of life? Will it go up or down? I guess if you're a part of the have group, uh, the quality of life will go up. But if you're in the rest, the middle class and lower, as the middle class, the trajectories widen, you may find your quality of life is extremely different. Certainly your civil liberties will be gone. As much toward more than that we could think about uh, impact. On political, we see, we already have seen on places like uh, uh, Greece and Cyprus and in Europe and Germany, etc., the re-emergence of of extreme groups, whether that be communists on one side or, or fascism on the other, uh, but in economic situations of this nature, 
we see the emergence of these two extremes. And uh, that can lead to lots of turbulence and disruption in the political systems can take place. The uh, high unemployment of uh, citizens, when you get um, 30, 40, 50 percent of your young working class from uh, 18 to 25 year olds that don't have a job or have student loans and can't pay for those things, that leads to a lot of dissatisfaction and potential disruption. And so we're going to see more of the, uh, as this uh, disruption takes place, if we see it accelerating, we're going to see the need for the state to step in and put stronger command and control over us, which again comes at the cost of our civil liberties. Some closing thoughts and recommendations. Um, internally, you and your company, here's what I'm asking you to do today, is to sit for a few minutes, and I want you to inventory and share the best internet of everything practices in your industry. I want you to visit your overall business strategy that are actually working and rolling out today and uh, see how you can exploit the latest internet of everything. Have you thought about what's happening, uh, the, the tractors on the farms or the, uh, the digital banking, uh, those things, take them into consideration. Have you identified your new ecosystem partners, people that you could work with, joint ventures, mergers, uh, those sort of things that can share the cost of some things, drive your costs down as you do it. Internet of Everything Startups, have you looked at some of those things you can do within your business to get them up and off the growing and harness that low-hanging fruit? And externally, can you be proactive outside your company, getting involved uh, in things of this nature? Can you lobby Canadian decision makers to increase, to invest, to increase their investment in digital infrastructure? Uh, can you encourage them to implement new training programs to help with this, uh, these jobs that are, that are going to be cast upon us, so these drivers and workers that uh, I certainly wouldn't advise anybody going in the trucking industry uh, five, ten years out, there just will not be enough jobs in the trucking industry. What are you going to do with those people? We need job uh, of, of the skills that will be of needed in the Internet of Everything. If you can't do that, then they're on the garbage heap. We've got to do something about it. Um, we need this collaboration between the three legs of the stool of academia, government, and business to, uh, to look and collaborate on this research and development that we're not doing in Canada. Uh, as Britain put $40 million into it in their budget this year, what are we doing about that? And you can lobby for that. Um, and then finally, we're at the strategic inflection point. You're at that point. You have to make that decision of going through this looking glass. Um, those that don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even more. So uh, you don't have any choice of this, folks. Uh, Churchill says the era of procrastination, of standing back and not jumping into the Facebook and Link and all these things that to link in, um, those are over. We're now entering a period of consequences. And so uh, you're going to step through the looking glass, and folks, there's just no turning back. Um, in any event, I uh, hope you found that useful and some thoughts to stimulate further thoughts. We'll talk more about it during the course. And my book will be out sometime in the, in the spring, and these draft documents and some of the cut and paste things I've done will be fleshed out there in far more detail. Anyway, that's it for the day, folks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.